little bit. Thank you very much. And so now, without further ado, um, today I'm very excited to welcome Francis Fukuyama, celebrating the release of liberalism and its discontents. Francis is an Olivier Nomelli Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He has previously taught at the Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies of John Hopkins University and at the George Mason University School of Public Policy. He was a researcher at the RAND Corporation and served as the deputy director in the State Department's policy planning staff. He is the author of Identity, Political Order and Political Decay, The Origins of Political Order, The End of History and The Last Man, Trust, and America at the Crossroads, Democracy, Power, and the Neoconservative Legacy. He lives with his wife in California. And so now, please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Francis Fukuyama. So, uh, thanks very much. It's really great to be back in a real bookstore. Uh, it reminds me how much I like bookstores in general. I also like being back in this neighborhood. You know, the first time I lived in Washington working at the State Department, I just lived down the street at 4849 Connecticut Avenue. So this is, I consider this, uh, you know, my old, uh, my old stomping ground. But it's very nice that you came out today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the book on liberalism, which I think is under very severe threat. But to do that, I need to define what I mean by liberalism, because it's not the way that it's used by many. Uh, I use it in a way that's not the same as the way other people do. Uh, I do not mean liberalism in the sense of American politics, of people that are progressive or left of center, because I think actually a lot of uh, them have become illiberal in many ways, which I'll explain. Uh, in Europe, if you use the term liberal, it usually refers to a center-right uh, uh, political uh, position like the Free Democrats in Germany that's kind of pro-market but socially progressive. I don't mean liberalism in the sense of libertarianism, which I regard as a kind of bizarre American <laughs> uh, uh, idea that's just hostile to the state sort of across the board, and that's certainly not my position. The kind of liberalism I uh, am referring to is what you might call a classical form of liberalism. It began in the middle of the 17th century, actually. Uh, at that point, Europe had been fighting uh, wars of religion for 150 years following the Protestant Reformation. And a number of liberal writers at that point uh, began to say, hey, maybe if we base our political system on a particular religion, a particular vision of the good life, we're going to do nothing but fight each other. Uh, and maybe we should have a political system in which we lower the horizons of politics. We agree that we want life itself rather than the good life. And we learn to tolerate people that have other visions uh, of, what the highest, uh, of what the highest goods are. Uh, and that's the basic idea that's animated liberalism since then. It developed into a doctrine that asserts that all human beings may differ uh, culturally, racially, by gender, by all of these characteristics, external characteristics, but they have a certain basic human dignity that is shared uh, not just by members of a particular ethnic or national group, but universally. And so all human beings have this dignity, and all human beings deserve to have that dignity protected. Uh, the institutions associated with liberalism are primarily a rule of law that does protect individuals from uh, the power of governments and, and of the state uh, by constitutions that try to limit uh, government power by checks and balances. Uh, and it's also been associated with a certain cognitive style, uh, modern natural science. And this doctrine that came into being around the same time as liberalism was being invented, asserts that there is an objective world beyond our subjective consciousnesses, uh, that we can perceive this world through the experimental method and then manipulate it. And that's what produces uh, modern technology, which in turn produces the kind of economic growth and productivity that uh, the world has seen really uh, since that period. So that's basically the kind of liberalism that I'm concerned with, whose most fundamental characteristics are 
uh, the rule of law. It's compatible with a lot of different economic policies. So I think social democratic Sweden and Denmark are liberal states because they protect uh, individual rights, as is you know the United States or Japan that have smaller welfare states, but nonetheless uh, 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 protect those rights through uh, through law. All right, so that's that's what liberalism is. So let me give you three reasons for wanting to be a liberal or for wanting to live in a liberal society. And I think one of the problems is that there's been a lot of attacks on liberalism from both the right and the left in recent um, uh, years. You now have a whole group of so-called post-liberal conservatives who think that liberalism is at fault for the ills of contemporary uh, society. And you have a lot of progressives, uh, you know, a lot of Gen Z types that think that liberalism is something that they're you know, their parents, baby boomers or grandparents believed in, but it's not relevant uh, to the present, and I think it still is. And so there's basically three reasons. So the first uh, is a practical one or a pragmatic one, which is that liberalism is fundamentally a means of governing diverse societies. Uh, back in the 17th century, the diversity was religious diversity. Protestants, Catholics, different sects of Protestants, uh, we're fighting and killing each other, and so liberalism said, we're not going to kill each other over these kinds of issues. In the 19th and 20th centuries, you had the rise of a very aggressive nationalism uh, that similarly led to the violence of the two world wars, and then once again in 1945, at the conclusion of those wars, you had the return of a liberal world order and liberalism within uh, the, the countries, at least of Western Europe, uh, that said, you know, different nations need to be able to get along. And, you know, the, the European Union, in a sense, was set up as a liberal international structure to manage uh, the peaceful relationship of these different, uh, these different nations, right? So that's the pragmatic virtue of liberalism. Uh, you can see this, by the way, in a country like India. India was founded by Gandhi and Nehru in the late 1940s, on liberal principles, and it's almost impossible to imagine how that country can be governed uh, other than that. I mean, lib uh, India is, you know, uh, is religiously diverse. It's diverse by caste, by region, by language. There's multiple uh, languages spoken uh, in India, and if you didn't have a basically liberal framework for that, uh, you would be having communal violence, you know, constantly. And the liberal order in India, I think, has preserved that nation up to the present. And right now, one of the big problems in India is that Prime Minister Modi and his uh, BJP Hindu Nationalist Party is trying to shift India's national identity away from a liberal one to one that's based on Hindu nationalism, uh, which is then stripping you know, citizen rights from Muslims and, you know, uh, taking away the status, uh, independent status of Kashmir and a lot of other things that inevitably are going to lead to violence, uh, just as he experienced when he was the chief minister in Gujarat and you had a lot of communal uh, rioting between these groups. And so that's the pragmatic argument. Now, the second argument is basically a moral one. Uh, liberalism protects human autonomy. Uh, I think that there's a very deep... Uh, uh, tradition uh, in the in the Judeo-Christian tradition that what gives dignity to human beings is um, is their ability to make moral choices, right? So if you think about why all people would be considered equal, certainly not equal in terms of intelligence, skin color, gender, you know, lots of uh, other characteristics, but there is a belief uh, that really begins, you know, it's articulated first, I would say, in the book of Genesis, where uh, Adam and Eve are told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They do it anyway, and they're cast out of the garden. And what that does is indicate that human beings actually can distinguish between right and wrong. In that particular case, they chose wrongly. They disobeyed God's uh, word, but they were able to choose. And I think that that has been the grounds on which many people have believed that human beings are moral beings, different from a plant or a rock or any other part of created nature, that you can make moral choices, uh, and that's what gives people that essential equality because everybody has that capacity for moral choice. That's what liberalism uh, protects. It's our autonomy, our ability to decide 
what to do in life, where to live, who to marry, uh, what beliefs to profess uh, that you know really make us human beings, and that's what uh, the rights that a liberal society protects uh, are meant to uh, uh, to foster. Finally, the third advantage of a liberal society is economic. Uh, among the rights that liberal societies protect are the right to own private property, to transact, uh, to make commercial transactions, to buy and sell. And for that reason, liberal societies have been associated with economic modernization and growth right from the beginning. So the Netherlands and England were the first two really liberal societies. They really led the commercial and then the industrial uh, revolutions. And up to the present, it's really, it's really that liberal protection of, uh, of these basic economic rights that has led to growth, even in a country like China. So China, contemporary China, is not a liberal society uh, uh, in terms of its political system. But beginning in 1978, when Deng Xiaoping reformed the system, uh, he did it by actually giving Chinese citizens certain economic rights, and in particular, quasi-property rights, where peasants no longer had to work uh, on collective farms, but they could actually keep the uh, fruits of their labor. And within four years, Chinese agricultural output doubled uh, because there's an incentive now for peasants to produce. And you know the right to buy and sell, own property, to transact, to start businesses, really is what powered this Amazing Chinese growth story that you know has been unfolding uh, over the over the years since 1978. So there's a connection between being a wealthy modern society uh, and having these kinds of liberal uh, principles, uh, or protecting these kinds of liberal principles. Now, what I argue in my book is that part of the reason that people are upset and unhappy with liberalism has not so much to do with the basic characteristics that I've just outlined, but by certain deformations of liberalism that took place both on the right and on the left. Uh, you might call the ones on the right neoliberalism and the ones on the left, I don't know, woke liberalism. I don't use that term, but it's a kind of short shorthand for understanding what's been going on. So let's begin with the, with the neoliberalism. Uh, it's not, you know, neoliberalism is thrown around a lot, oftentimes as a synonym for capitalism. I don't use it that way. I think that neoliberalism for me was a certain extension of basic free market principles that really arose in the 1980s and 90s under Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, politicians that wanted to advocate free markets, led intellectually by people like Milton Friedman, a number of Nobel Prize winning economists, so-called Chicago School. They begin with a correct insight that private property and markets are important for economic growth, but they carry that to an extreme where the state is denegraded uh, and, you know, uh, and, and neoliberals attempt to cut back the state in terms of social protections, regulation, and the like. Uh, and this leads to markets creating huge inequalities. Inequality in especially the most liberal societies or the most neoliberal countries, Britain and the United States, have grown enormously uh, since the 1960s. The deregulation, especially of the financial sector, is what leads directly to the cascading set of financial uh, crises that take place in the 1990s and then culminates in the 2008 uh, subprime crisis in the United States. This, in turn, uh, is very bad for a lot of ordinary people who lose their uh, homes uh, because their mortgages are underwater, whereas the elites, uh, you know, the bankers and the, the hedge fund managers and so forth that created that system experience maybe a year or two of disruption, but basically they end up uh, fine. And I would say that this is really what propels a lot of the populism that then appears in the subsequent decade, both on the right and the left. Ordinary people suffering from neoliberal policies that uh, uh, don't seem to be benefiting and seem, in fact seem to be uh, hurting them. You know, what you might call the woke liberalism uh, is different because they start with another correct premise, which is that liberalism protects individual autonomy, but 
you know, in my view, they carry that uh, autonomy to uh, an extreme where autonomy uh, is seen as a good in itself and not, uh, you know, embedded in, a, in an existing or a pre-existing uh, moral framework, that people exist simply to be able to make choices regardless of what those uh, choices are, which if you think about it makes society impossible because what makes a society is the fact that there are commonly shared rules and you know people have uh, norms that embed them in communities and that's really what a lot of people want out of life is that ability to uh, uh, to work together with other people. If people have the ability not just to follow the rules or not, but to actually make up their own rules, you're not going to have much of a structure of society. The um, way that this manifests is in uh, identity politics. And for me, there's really two versions of identity politics, one of which I believe in and, and support, which is the liberal version. And then there's another version that's not so liberal. The liberal version says there are many uh, marginalized groups, African Americans, you know, immigrants, women, LGBTQ people, and their rights are not being respected. They are not being incorporated into the uh, mainstream society, and they ought to be. Uh, you know, this was basically the message of Martin Luther King in the, in the civil rights movement, that black people were not being treated the same as white people and that they ought to have the same rights uh, and opportunities. And that, you know, to me is a liberal idea, and a liberal state ought to, produce, uh, ought to pursue uh, that version of identity politics. All identity politics does in that case is to mobilize people, get them angry about their marginalization, and then use the democratic system to, you know, force changes. There's, however, a different form that I think is less liberal, which says that it's actually the individualism that's the target, that we are really members of groups before we are, you know, individuals, uh, and that our group characteristics are more important and more essential in evaluating us, you know, for jobs, for promotion, for employment, for whatever, than what we've achieved as individuals. I think it's obvious that our group memberships do affect, you know, our sense of identity and that those are very important to us, but there's a kind of absolute absolutization of these group identities that then begins to question, you know, the underlying premise of uh, equal individuals that is really critical to you know the liberal approach to uh, approach to politics, and at an extreme, you know you actually have cases of countries in which this kind of group identity politics becomes dominant. I mean, you know Lebanon or Bosnia or Syria. You know there's any number of countries that have actually fallen apart in recent years because the politics is all about a zero sum distribution of goods, you know, between established um, uh, established identity uh, groups. And that form is fundamentally, I think, not compatible with a well-functioning democracy, and it's also, I think, not compatible with uh, liberal principles. Now, between these two uh, threats, uh, or, well, so, let me back up a little bit. So the, the extension of these liberal ideas to what I regard as these more extreme forms then, I think, go a long way to explaining the current polarization uh, that's hit the United States, but other societies as well, because on the right there's an intense dislike of this illiberal form of identity politics, and on the left uh, there's a, certainly a big reaction to the economic and social inequality that's been produced by neoliberal uh, economics. And in many respects, you know, the two sides have, have mobilized against each other, and it's landed us in the current, I think, very dangerous situation that we're in in the United States as a society. And in fact, you know, to my sorrow, <laughs> uh, the United States, I think, suffers from this probably more than almost any other uh, established democracy in the world today. Uh, now, if you ask, you know, I've been speaking as if I'm being very even-handed between the left and the right. Uh, if you ask me which of these threats uh, to liberalism is more important, the one coming from the contemporary right or the one coming from the left, 
I would say, without question, right now it is the one coming from the right, because, you know, the the extreme right in the United States, I think many of them have broken with the basic, both liberalism and and with democracy itself. Uh, you know, we found out, for example, through the January 6th Commission, if you've been following their work, uh, they've actually revealed that that attack on the Capitol wasn't uh, just a spontaneous demonstration that somehow got out of hand, that it had been planned ahead of time, you know, by the president and a small group of uh, advisors, and its direct purpose was to overturn a legitimate election. And, you know, in a way, what's worse than the actual assault was the fact that then, you know, a lot of the Republican Party has sought to normalize what happened and say, oh, it's not that big a deal. Whereas I think it's one of the biggest deals that we've faced, you know, since the Civil War in terms of the uh, continuity and the principles of American, uh, of American democracy. And, you know, the coming election in 2024 will be a big test about whether our institutions uh, can actually uh, survive this assault. So I think that that's a clear and present immediate danger. The danger on the left is, is a little bit more, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's more long term because it's primarily a cultural uh, phenomenon and it occurs, you know, primarily in certain more or less elite uh, cultural institutions like universities, the arts, Hollywood, uh, and so forth. But I think that there are tendencies there that are illiberal towards intolerance. So many right-wing ethno-nationalists in the United States don't like the diversity represented by, you know, our racial uh, diversity, by uh, immigration uh, and the like. Uh, I think there is a tendency on the left not to tolerate certain kinds of political diversity or diversity with regard to religion, you know, or holding uh, people that hold, you know, deeply uh, felt uh, religious views. But I would say, you know, to repeat, I think the the threat on the um, the threat on the right is is much more severe at the present moment. Um, so this is the kind of situation that we are facing at the moment. The other big problem is the one regarding our cognitive framework because, as I said, liberalism was strongly associated with modern natural science. Uh, I have a chapter in the, in the book tracing the attack on science that has appeared over the years. And this one actually, in my view, begins on the, on the left rather than on the right. Uh, I know this stuff very well because in my younger days, I went to France and I studied with a lot of postmodernist, you know, French uh, intellectuals like Jacques Derrida or Roland Barthes. I met Michel Foucault actually when I was still an undergraduate at Cornell. And, you know, that intellectual tradition begins with a skepticism about objectivity in a certain way, that language uh, for many um, structuralists is not something that reflects the real world. It's, it's a kind of imposition by s the speakers of the, of the words on that reality that then shapes the reality. Uh, and this expands into a kind of across the board subjectivism where that reality is increasingly questioned and it's really only your consciousness of it that uh, matters, but everybody's consciousness is different, and so there's a questioning about the solidity of that uh, reality. Uh, this is articulated the most fully by Michel Foucault. He has a concept of biopower. So Foucault argued uh, in a series of really brilliant books, he said, uh, look, in the old days, a ruler would uh, be able to order the death of any one of his subjects if he didn't like uh, what they were saying. And so you used fear in that very overt way. Today it's a little bit different. Uh, a ruler doesn't kill his subjects. He uh, tries to use the language of science to persuade people that something uh, is true, whereas in fact it simply represents the interest of the elites that are behind the scenes manipulating the society. And he. He showed this with respect to phenomena like incarceration, homosexuality, uh, madness, uh, that these were all concepts that were defined ostensibly scientifically, but in fact they reflected uh, a kind of power interest on the part of uh, existing elites that wanted to keep these different groups uh, marginalized in different ways. 
Uh, and by the end of his career, he had extended this idea of biopower to virtually uh, everything. And so, in my view, in a way, Foucault is the original conspiracy theorist, right? That nothing is actually the way it seems, and if you think that something is simply you know, true because a scientist says it's true, you know, you, you're not understanding the way you're manipulated. So, does this sound familiar to you? Uh, it should, because it's now drifted over from the left to the right. So during the COVID epidemic, what do we get? We get a lot of conservatives saying, you know, uh, the public health authorities that are telling you that you need to wear masks and get vaccinated aren't actually scientists that are just reporting, uh, you know, objective scientific findings. They're actually representing the, 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 the interests of elites that want to have power over you. That's why they're making these mandates uh, and you should distrust their authority. And that leads us into this uh, cognitive wasteland that then is hugely amplified by the technological development of the internet uh, over this same period, right? Where it used to be that the information people would get had to be vetted by certain institutions, you know, legacy media, the courts, uh, scientific journals, uh, and the like before they would be accepted. What the internet did was basically allow anyone to say anything they wanted. Uh, we thought initially this was going to be great because, you know, we take away the power of these, uh, these hierarchical gatekeepers, but it turns out that anyone can then weaponize the uh, internet and anyone can say uh, anything they want. So when you combine that technological capacity with an intellectual framework that tells you that everything is essentially subjective and that you shouldn't trust uh, any kind of established authority, you get this what you know you would have to label an epistemic relativism that um, you know we, we liberalism in a, in, a, in a sense endorses a certain kind of moral relativism because we're not all going to agree on what moral truths are, but at least we sort of thought we agreed on, you know, factual information like, you know, is this vaccine safe or who won the 2020 presidential election? But under epistemic relativism, you're not even agreed on, you know, those basic facts. Uh, and that makes actually a liberal society or liberal democracy pretty hard to sustain uh, because, you know, you can't deliberate if you can't actually agree on, um, on kind of empirical uh, facts and empirical uh, truth. So, uh, maybe the last thing I'll mention, I, the, the book is not a policy book. I've worked my whole life in policy institutions and taught at policy schools, and I could go on and on about, um, you know, a laundry list of things that you might do to mitigate the current uh, polarization. Uh, I don't try to do this in this book because I think, f you know, that in, in many ways, policies and politics are downstream of ideas and culture. And if you don't establish the proper ideas and the cultural framework first, uh, you're not going to derive the right uh, uh, policies and actions. And you know, so that's where I'm situating this book. I want to establish, you know, what liberalism is and why, uh, and why it's important. Um, there are a couple of things that I would say would be important to uh, establish liberalism more firmly. One of them has to do with uh, the idea of nations and national identity. There is an ostensible contradiction between liberals who believe that all human beings, regardless of where they live, have equal human rights. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they're American or they're living in Bangladesh or Kenya or wherever, they've all got uh, equal rights, and yet we're all divided into nations uh, in which our jurisdiction really doesn't extend to anyone but, uh, you know, people living in, in in our territory. Um, you can read it in the book, but I, I believe that liberal theory doesn't really tell you why we're divided into the nations we are, but they, they remain important because the nation is still the custodian of force, you know, of coercive power represented by things like armies and police forces. We need these in order to, you know, protect ourselves from external and internal uh, security threats, but also to basically deliver services to um, enforce laws uh, and the like. Uh, and at the moment, the only mechanisms we have for controlling this kind of power exist at a uh, nation state level. 
you know, the, those control mechanisms are things like courts, legislatures, independent media, and we don't have the power, you know, we don't know how to build a transnational authority that would be powerful enough to do things and yet would be controlled and used, you know, um, uh, effectively. But, you know, the other consideration just has to do with our emotional attachments. Uh, the nation is at the moment probably the largest social unit to which people feel an instinctive, uh, you know, uh, emotional attachment. Uh, generally speaking, the larger the group, the more attenuated your, you know, your feelings of solidarity. Uh, and this is important because I don't think you can sustain a, um, a liberal society without that. I'll just, ex I'll, I'll conclude by illustrating what's going on right now in Ukraine, because Ukraine, in my view, is, is it's the front line of a big struggle against, uh, or foreign against uh, liberal values. 2019, Putin gives an interview with the FT. He says, liberalism is an obsolete doctrine, and he has been building, you know, a powerful illiberal state. Uh, and he has been trying to absorb and eliminate the independent nation of Ukraine because it, he, you know, he doesn't think it has the right to exist. Uh, he was very mistaken in this because uh, Ukraine has actually resisted tenaciously. But if you ask, why are the Ukrainians fighting back so hard? You know, they are dying in great numbers in order to prevent you know, being uh, taken over and conquered by Russia. Why are they doing it? And there's been a debate. Do the Ukrainians really, are they fighting on behalf of liberal democracy or are they just fighting in, 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 you know, for sovereignty? It wouldn't matter what kind of government they had as long as it wasn't, you know, controlled from Russia or some other outside power. And I would say that it's really both, that very few people fight and die risk their lives for liberalism as an abstract cause. They fight and die for it as, as it is implemented and embedded in an actual nation, uh, and in fact embedded in their nation. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine over the last seven, eight years, and have lots of Ukrainian friends, and I know that this is the case with you know virtually all of them, that they actually are both Ukrainian patriots, but you know, why are they, why do they like, why do they love Ukraine? It really has to do with the fact that it's not Russia, that it's a fundamentally free society. You can criticize the government. You can come and go. The state isn't monitoring you or putting you in jail for, you know, the slightest uh, disobedience to its, uh, to its rules. Uh, and that's why they're willing to, you know, to fight on its behalf. And I think if you don't have that kind of instinctive loyalty to liberal values uh, embedded in a liberal regime, uh, that regime isn't going to work. But the idea of the nation that people fight and die for has to be a liberal one. There are plenty of illiberal forms of national identity that are based on ethnicity, race, uh, you know, kind of deeply, or religion, very uh, deeply inherited, uh, narrow set of cultural values that, that people can't necessarily um, share in, uh, and that's not a good form of national identity. You need a liberal form of national identity that is inclusive of everyone that actually lives in your society. So with that, I'll stop, and I look forward, if any of you have uh, questions, I'm uh, eager to start the discussion. Thank you very much. So have you factored in what used to be called the paranoid style of American politics? And do you have a suggestion for how we cope with the situation now where the Republicans or many Republicans financed by big business are determined to make a society where they control everything? Uh, and, and then what do we do? An illiberal, an illiberal society um, funded by the Koch brothers. Well, uh, I think what you do is you fight back using the tools that democracy itself gives you, right? So in a democracy, if you don't like the fact that, you know, these things are unfolding, you mobilize people, you get them to vote, uh, you put up candidates, and you also, I think, have to have an alternative to this, you know, which I agree is a very dark and dangerous, you know, trend. You have to have a plausible, um, uh, alternative to that. 
and I would say that uh, you know, right? I mean, I, 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 in the book, I don't get into kind of short-term, you know, American politics, but I would say that right now the um, the progressive side of the le uh, ledger has not been actually putting up uh, uh, the kind of agenda that would actually uh, entice a lot of, especially swing state voters, to you know vote for their party. So you need to do all of those things. You need to call a spade a spade and you know attack uh, the kind of anti-democratic things that are going on in the Republican Party. You have to pose a, a plausible alternative, and then you got to get people concerned and angry. One of the big problems right now is that. You know, I, as a political scientist, believe that you know this uh, effort to change the laws on a state level uh, to be able to override a democratic outcome in 2024 is the single biggest threat to American democracy. Do ordinary voters care about this? No. I mean, you cannot get people upset. I mean, they care about inflation. They care about gas prices. A lot of. I'm not saying that that's not something. You know, you understand why that's the case, but right now people don't understand that their democracy is at risk and you've somehow got to explain that to them and, and get them mobilized around that issue. So Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, just to follow up on the, uh, as you mentioned, the significance of the conflict in Ukraine to liberalism and to Western liberal democracies. I'd just like if you could comment, uh, how do you see that conflict playing out in the next weeks? And also, what could we anticipate from the Western liberal democracies' uh, response yeah. in considering its significance? No, it's a, good, uh, it's a good question. I have a blog uh, whose title is Frankly Fukuyama. I, I helped to establish a, an online journal called AmericanPurpose.com, and you can find the blog there. So I've been writing a lot about uh, uh, about Ukraine, uh, and I have right from the beginning been much more optimistic about the way that this war would go militarily, uh, because Russian competence and morale are just catastrophic. Uh, and the Ukrainians, you know, something, I mean, there have been uh, hundreds of thousands of Russians that have left Russia since the beginning of the conflict. There's like a quarter million Ukrainians that came back to Ukraine from other parts of Europe once the war started because they wanted to defend their country. And so there's just a huge imbalance in, in the moral factor uh, the, on the two sides, plus which you know the Ukrainians are much better led and so forth. So I'm not surprised that they've actually driven the Russians out of the Kiev, uh, Kiev region and Kharkiv now. And you know my hope is that they can actually drive them out of the south and, and get back much of the Donbass. At that point, you might be able to talk about a ceasefire or some kind of political settlement. Right now, it's not possible with the Russians occupying that much of Ukraine's territory. But I do think that it's 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 bad to do what the New York Times just did in a recent editorial to say, well, the war is hopeless. It's just going to bog down here, and therefore we need to push the Ukrainians to accept you know that outcome because I don't think they need to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I suppose what I'm about to present is just to see what, how you reflect on it. OK. Um, yes to just about every word you said. Um, if, however, there is not somehow a questioning of what it means to be a human being at this point in history, and just not for America, but worldwide, we will never get anywhere because we have to find out if we've become obsolete in our own creation. That's one thing. The other thing that is so fundamental, we'll probably agree, is that if we never ask about what are the roles of wealth and power, regardless of what the underlying philosophy is, because essentially you could even take communism, and if you could get a wonderful uh, way of doing your governing to really do it for the people, mm -hmm. that could work. So any of these things have a possibility, left, right, whatever, but if we don't understand 
the fundamental nature of wealth and power and the tendency to grab onto it, it will never get anywhere. Yeah, well, uh, wealth and power have always been big drivers uh, of human motivation, and uh, you know, it's not as if they're a new thing. I think that you know, what's uh, different about the modern world is that in a properly governed market economy, you can pursue wealth and power in a way that is socially beneficial to a lot of other people besides yourself. Like you create a new technology that then has lots of spillover effects, you know, in medicine and IT and you know a lot of other areas. Uh, and uh, the issue really is having the correct political framework to control the consequences of that kind of, you know, basically market innovation. Uh, in my view, you can't just have a liberal society that has these rules that permit market exchange because left to a you know, left to itself, that kind of capitalism produces too much inequality, and therefore it really needs to be mated to democracy. Uh, people have to be able to uh, mobilize and push back and, you know, do re redistribution, create controls on, you know, out of control banks and, you know, um, uh, uh, economic actors. Uh, and it's possible to do that. I mean, that's kind of the history of the last 150 years is, the market spreads and then, you know, you create new institutions to control it and then it evolves further. Uh, and, you know, right now the financial sector, for example, is evolving, you know, in this kind of really crazy, very uncontrolled way and we're trying to grapple with how we, you know, how we deal with that. But I don't see the alternative to, you know, trying to keep this under control using the existing mechanisms that we, uh, that we have because you're right that, you know, if you don't control it, you're going to end up with a very uh, unequal and, you know, not very just society. Thank you. Um, hi, I would just like to say it's an honor to see you face to face. Um, so my question is, do you think that liberalism is just as much to blame for the rise of I illiberalism as like the as a liberalism itself, like the emphasis on the individual rights, um, mm -hmm. putting forth kind of the idea that everybody should be heard, um, that markets should be free, that governments can't, um, that governments can, can't enforce censorship, um, and that, yeah, I'm sorry, I kind of forgot my question. Yeah. Standing no, I there, understand. But, yeah. Uh, so, that actually is a, a question and a criticism that's come up in, you know, as I presented the book. Uh, my claim is that you have a form of classical liberalism that was relatively moderate, that accepted the basic principles of human dignity and the rule of law, and, you know, that that worked pretty well, but it's been deformed by certain extensions of those principles uh, in ways that then become illiberal, and that's what sets off a uh, you know, a reaction. So neoliberalism, you know, in the economic sphere and, you know, a kind of unlimited autonomy uh, in the, you know, in the personal sphere. And, um, you know, some of the critics have said, well, you say that these are deformations of liberalism, but I think that they're actually intrinsic to, to liberalism, that a liberal, you know, you start with liberal principles, you're inevitably going to get to this point of, kind of unlimited capitalism and unlimited, you know, human autonomy. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a serious idea, and, and, uh, but I don't think actually that it's correct, uh, that I think, you know, you've had uh, efforts to pull back on some of those principles. For example, right now, we've re-injected the state into the regulation of, uh, you know, the capital, the capital market capitalist market, you know, in in, uh, in Europe, they've got a really serious effort at antitrust to control these big uh, companies. In the United States, you know, we've returned to government intervention to support people, you know, spending and, and, and you know, giving up on austerity and this sort of thing. So I think, you know, there is the possibility of readjusting these policies so that, you know, they're not taken to these, um, uh, these extremes. Okay. Um if you don't mind, I remembered what I was trying to ask. Um, so 
liberalism's fault is its inability to thwart illiberalism, I feel. And as a result, within the last 15 years, we've seen a rise of right-wing authoritarianism. Yeah. Well, look, yeah, that's right. I mean, you're not going to defeat the right by becoming authoritarian yourself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and forbidding certain things from being said. I think there's other things that you can do to prevent the artificial um, amplification of you know certain voices. And that's why I think the internet platforms really need to be regulated in, in, in some way. But yeah, you're right. I mean, liberals believe in freedom of speech and you're not gonna be a liberal if you start simply banning certain, you know, right-wing voices. Thanks. Hi. Hi I was wondering um, if you had a perspective on the recent election in the Philippines with the Marcos being restored to power and disinformation essentially erasing a large portion of history for that country. Yeah, well, it's bad. <laughs> Uh, it, it's it's really very disappointing that the Philippines voted this way, uh, but it's part of a larger trend. I mean, according to Freedom House, uh, you know, they publish an annual Freedom in the World report, and liberal democracy has been in decline for the last 16 years. Uh, and we've seen recent setbacks in Myanmar, you know, in uh, Sri Lanka, in, you know, India, in the United States, uh, and in the Philippines, in Tunisia so forth and so we're definitely in a very difficult period of world history where a lot of the gains for liberal democracy that occurred in the period from the 1970s up until the early 2000s uh, is being reversed and they get kind of cumulative because if one of these strong men rulers succeeds in one country uh, they're going to succeed in others that's by the way another reason why i think that the war in ukraine is actually important for a lot of people outside of ukraine uh, because, you know, the dominant model of a strongman ruler is Putin himself. And he's had uh, good relations with all of the populist nationalists around the world. You know, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour in, in you know, in France, um, and Donald Trump in the United States, who to this day has never said a single negative word about, you know, about Putin. And so uh, I think that you've got to demonstrate that this kind of uh, strongman government doesn't work. Now, that's why I think there's a little bit of hope just in what's happened recently, because you've had two really big authoritarian failures, like the war in Ukraine is obviously one of the biggest miscalculations, you know, done by any, you know, great power leader in, in, in living memory. Uh, and I think that you know, what the Chinese are doing in terms of their zero COVID policy, which to me seems really crazy, um, locking down an entire city of 25 million people for two months, uh, uh, just so Xi Jinping doesn't have to admit that he was wrong about, you know, about this. I mean, that could only happen in a, uh, in a uh, authoritarian country with no checks and balances, right? And so I think that there is some hope that you know, the perceived advantages of these uh, authoritarian governments is going to recede as these authoritarian failures uh, pile up. But, you know, democracies have to do better themselves. They have to show that they can deliver on basic public goods and, you know, things that people want. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm not giving up hope yet. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, um, I've kind of got two questions. Should I ask both at the same time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So then I get to decide which one I answer, <laughs> yeah. if I don't like one of them. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask, first of all, uh, I think it's kind of liberalism is all about equating difference, but what happens when people disagree? So like we're seeing with, like in the latest WTO convention, it kind of happened that there were so many voices that nobody could come to an agreement and they had to actually call it off. Yeah. So what mechanisms does liberalism have, yeah, for that kind of not to happen? Um, in which case, doesn't that kind of make like questioning epistemology a bit more relevant? And then my other question is um, that the thing that you said about objectivism, what I've noticed is that objectivism, it seems like it's all about what you can prove with quantitative data and that kind of thing. But 
an objective policy that's uh, created will always have subjective results. Like some people will be really happy with what happens and some people won't. So I was just wondering, yeah, um, how you can kind of value that maybe qualitative data that would come from objectivism, how yeah. that balances out. Sure. So on the first question, uh, one of the big challenges to, it's not just liberalism, but liberal democracy, where you want to give lots of people a voice in making decisions, is that you know societies can be so diverse that it's really hard to actually come to a, an agreement. So most political institutions have mechanisms for uh, forcing a decision and, and forcing people to agree. Like right now, the European Union, 27 members, any one of them can veto a foreign policy decision and therefore Hungary can stop you know the EU from criticizing China or doing you know a lot of the things that it would like to do and that's why you know you move to something like majority voting or qualified majority voting or you know you create an executive authority to which you delegate the ability to make decisions and so um, it doesn't always work and it is a big problem if you want to make everybody happy in some a lot of cases uh, it, it's simply not going to happen but you know that's the way uh, decision making is supposed to work in a open society. On the question of subjectivism, uh, you know the the issue is not that people are subjectively going to react to an event or you know a decision or or something. The question is really about factual information. Uh, is it completely subjective that we? say, oh yeah, there's Connecticut Avenue outside you know, of this bookstore, and I know what the name of that street is, that's, that's what it is. Uh, should that be subject to people saying, well, you know, that's just your opinion. I mean, I have opinion, my opinion is it's Wisconsin Avenue, right? So um, I think that that's really the issue that I was trying to talk about, that um, you know, just simple factual information uh, is not, you know, we all have a subjective window onto that outside reality, but what the scientific method does is to try to uh, get past it through a social process that you know brings in evidence, refutes uh, held positions because it doesn't correspond to the evidence, and then that position can be refuted, and you know it's kind of an unending social process, but it actually tries to get you closer and closer to what that objective reality is. Uh, and that process is social, but it's not, it's not simply subjective, so. Thank you. Sure. Hello, mine is not a very serious question. I apologize for that, but <laughs> um, in retrospect, do you wish you had given your book, The End of History, a different title, considering the number of people who criticize that phrase without actually reading the book? Well, look, the, the title, the title was not mine. Uh, you know, the, the philosopher that talked about the end of history was was uh, Hegel, uh, and it was his concept as, you know, then in the 20th century reinterpreted by Alexandre Kojève, who was probably the greatest 20th century interpreter of Hegel. And Karl Marx had that idea. You know, he said that there was an end of history, and that that end of history would be communism. Uh, and uh, so I was simply saying that you know, the Hegelian version of the end of history looked more plausible than the Marxist version, you know, after the, you know, well, it was before the fall of communism, but anticipating that. Uh, so I don't apologize for using it. I think that, you know, people <laughs> simply did not understand, you know, what I was trying to argue. So it's true I've had to correct them, you know, continuously for the last 30 years. Uh, that's not fun, but, you know, that's life. If I can add a personal anecdote to that, I was once in, in the French uh, diplomatic circles and there was a great number of people who liked to start a phrase at cocktail parties by saying, Fukuyama's greatest mistake was yeah. that, <laughs> but they never read your book. It's, it's not just there. Yeah. A lot of people do that. Sorry for that. Okay. Okay. There are no many questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, and thank you all for joining today and for your wonderful questions and for your fantastic presentation. Um, we do have books signed available at the registers, but he will personalize, so if you could just line up right here and um, please fold up your chairs and lean them against something solid. So let's all give uh, Francis a warm round of applause.